Welcome uh, everyone to the fourth edition of Music Lab. Um, hello, yeah. Um, it's really nice if everybody can come and sit and, and don't be shy, come up close. Uh, it's going to be great. And um, so, yeah, many of you, you have not been to Music Lab before, so I'm just going to tell you what it is. Um, it's a mix of live music and live research. And it's a collaboration between Ritmo and uh, uh, the University Library. So uh, some of us here have become, have signed up as uh, guinea pigs. So I am one of them. I'm wearing an accelerometer. It's going to track how I move um, during listening to the music. Um, Victor, do you have enough guinea pigs now or you still need more? Yeah, okay. So we are 10 guinea pigs in the audience and then the audience, uh, I mean the musicians, are also equipped with these accelerometers. So we're going to see um, how that works. And we have uh, three great utopian uh, musicians here today. They are called uh, Chichao Lan, and Tejaswini Kelkar, and Shara Erdem. Okay, so, and after the concert, we're going to have a discussion with an expert panel. And at the end, there will be data jogging. So we have a data jockey here today. His name is Victor, and he's the guy who is also doing the data collection. He will be showing you how, you're, how you moved during the music performance, if you're interested in seeing. Okay, so yeah, let's start.
For the bells are here to mean revolution and the prisons. Strong cars cannot be in my mind. But with everyone inside, not too close to breathe. My street lights in watercolor yellow and midnight white. No matter which street this is, or which day, or which festival we're decorating for, or what is the turn of the seasons. Buy a ride is anonymous disappearance in an unnamed city. Thank you, thank you. Do you have a band name? <laughs> do, no? do we have a band name? Yeah, you need to work on that. Band name, please. <laughs> yeah, so um, we're going to have a short uh, break, five, ten minutes, just to rig the stage. And um, um, I work at the Science Library, so I brought some books about, the, about utopia. Uh, and most of the utopias turn into dystopias. So feel free to have a, a look at them as well and see you in a few minutes. Yeah, so we are ready to have the super intellectual discussion about what just happened. Okay. What we call the intellectual warm down. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so uh, we have um, some experts here and I'd like, to, I'd like you to introduce yourself, uh, starting with uh, Jonna Wuskowski. Uh, so my name is Jonna Woskoski. Uh, I'm an uh, <laughs> associate professor uh, in music cognition at the University of Oslo and also a member of uh, the Ritmo Center. And my area of expertise is uh, the psychology of music and music cognition. So how our minds and brains react to music, how they make sense of music. Um, my name is Teja Sveni. I will soon be defending my... Um, my doctorate in music and technology in a couple of weeks, and I work. My work is mostly on body motion and melody. 
And my name is Alexander Jensenius. I'm an associate professor of music technology at the University of Oslo and also deputy director of RITMO, uh, one of the initiators behind this, uh, behind this music lab concept. Great. So uh, I'd like to start with a question to Tejas Sweeney. Um, so how, when you developed this concert with your colleagues, what were you thinking about it and how does it relate to Utopia? Um, when we speak about musical utopia, uh, a lot of people think about music that is that has qualities that are not musical, in that the clarity of the melody and the repetitiveness and the rhythm is not the most obvious point of the music. But uh, these musical cultures have also been around for a really long time. Uh, uh, and subcultures, and the, the po point from which we started developing this was uh, pulling on our interests in uh, physical resonance and biophysical music and how to translate from, from movement to music and how to bring out the sonic characteristics of physical objects and um, how to make that audible. Okay, so, so which physical objects did you use? So I've been using a couple of uh, various kitchen material, and uh, I like how they sound, and I like the idea that the same voice sounds different in each object. When we speak about music and the body, we talk about our own bodies, but uh, the things that we hear music out of are also bodies, and the rooms that we sit in are also bodies, and there's physicality and materiali materiality and all of these things. And uh, I think hearing resonances brings that out a little bit. Um, with these resonators, I've also been experimenting with using them on other people's bodies and <laughs> having speech through other people's bodies, which is, I think is fun and creepy. Uh, <laughs> happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> there was also some, uh, some coding going on. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, would you like to show us the Yeah, the they look like little spiders, which is perfect. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they're, so I amplify them before, before they get to resonate and yeah. Um, to, yeah, to bring out the noisiness. Yeah, and um, somebody in the audience was also curious about the, the programming language that was in use, and it was actually developed by Chichao Lan himself, and it's called Quaver Series. Yeah, so yeah. And is that uh, somebody, something people can use as well? Yeah, I think it's a, yeah, it is uh, released and it's open to use, Chicha's work, and Chari's work is also, if not, it will be released. It's a patch written for Max, and these armbands called Mayos, and his interest is in the core of biophysical music, and yeah. those will also be... Great. Okay. And um, at the end of the discussion, we will we will open up for questions from the audience as well. But if you really want to say something right away, just raise your hand and, and speak ask, speak out loud. Yeah. Um, but I have a question now for uh, you, Alexander. Um, and I know that you're particularly inter interested in the relationship between humans and machines. And uh, could you maybe say a little bit about this in relation to this concert? Yeah, so so when we when we started thinking about creating kind of an utopian concert, uh, to me at least, then thinking about the relationship between between the body and and machines, kind of at large, in whether it's a it's a computer or it's a robot or if it's just a device, uh, uh, that was kind of an interesting thing. And and um, since I've been working with both Tisha Sweeney HR and Chichao, it was it was fun to kind of put them together and and, and and see if we could get something out of because they're coming at this from very different perspectives, um, where Chichao is is working very much from software uh, to start with, uh, with the uh, live coding, as you saw there, and and the char is working very much with with the muscles and trying to look at kind of what's what you what you we really cannot see uh, when it comes to the body, but that you can kind of see if you can use it with the uh, with the machine, and of course then there's just really things with the resonators. Is so there's kind of different different angles at this, and and this is something that I, I'm working on now in my own research as well to so try to understand. Uh, music making that we do originally then kind of has been kind of t touching something, making sound by clapping your hands, touching different types of physical objects, and you can, can feel the resonance in the object itself. So a traditional acoustic music making where you play a normal instrument, you have this kind of what I call an action sound coupling, where it's really a tight 
uh, intimate relationship between you and the sound. You can feel the sound, like if you play on a classic guitar, for example, you can really feel the strings vibrate. And then when we work as music technologists, when we work and try to see how can we make music with technologies, you kind of you feel that you are you're kind of just pushing buttons and you kind of really feel disconnected or disembodied, you, you may say. So a lot of the research that we are doing and uh, that we also saw in the performance today is to try to see how can we bring the body closer to the technology or how can we bring the technology closer to the body and experience that in a musical context. So this was just kind of three different examples of how we work with this kind of uh, utopian type of thinking. Yeah, um, okay, so Jonna. Um, a part of today's performance involved measuring the motion of uh, audience members. Um, and what are your thoughts about how audiences respond to different kinds of music? And um, are they also interrelated? Yeah, so we know, we know that um, movement is very intimately related to music. There's something about music that makes us want to move our bodies from a very early age. And especially from, um, if you think of more kind of typical traditional music, with, which has a, a clear pulse or a rhythm, um, we actually know from research that we use our uh, the areas in the brain which are responsible for movement and planning movement, motor actions. They are actually the ones that are processing rhythm in music. So it's it, there's this coupling between uh, movement and understanding rhythm. Um, but then, of course, like in, in the performance we saw today, there, there was not such a, like a clear, clear pulse or rhythm, at least not all, all the time. But there are lots of other ways in which also music makes us move. So, um, for example, the types of uh, expressions or uh, gestures or movements we saw the performers making on the stage. We actually, we have, um, in our brains, we have kind of specialized systems which are kind of mirroring or simulating the, the intentions and the, and the movements that we observe other people doing. And that's how we understand uh, other people's intentions. Uh, that's also how we experience empathy. So we kind of, we can't help but somehow internally simulate what we see other people doing. Uh, and we might actually, that might kind of even reach the level of mirroring or mimicking what we see people doing on the stage. So that's at least one interesting thing to see. Uh, if there's a correspondence between some of the movements or actions um, uh, we saw on the stage and, and how people uh, responded. Um, and, and interestingly, this type of mirroring, uh, when we are actually engaged in mirroring someone else's movements, that actually also creates social bonding. So often in, in concerts, if people are dancing together or moving together or having this kind of shared experience, it actually leads to this um, feeling of togetherness or closeness or, or, or bondedness, which is really interesting. It sounds like something that could um, help make the world a better place if we can all yeah. bond through music. Exactly, I guess that's the utopia aspect. Yeah. <laughs> music can make the world a better place. But I mean, some, some people maybe have a, a more developed sense of empathy. Um, mm -hmm. So. Are there people who do not react this way because maybe they don't have this the same level of empathy in them? Well, we do have some very interesting preliminary research showing that actually empathy might be related to how, how likely you are to move to music or to react to music. Um, there's also uh, research showing um, like emotional reactions to music, even at the level of physiological responses. Uh, are related to your level of empathy. So it, mm. it does seem like more empathic people react more strongly to, so, to so music. It's, so it's a good way if you want to choose a new friend or a new <laughs> boyfriend, you just, you dance and you see if they're moving to the rhythm and then that's a good test, right? <laughs> yeah, well, just to kind of follow up there, because this is a, this is kind of at the core of what we are dis uh, really studying now, and, and we there are kind of two conflicting hypotheses here in a way, because you can in one way you can say that you engage with music by kind of moving to the music, because we often say that music moves us. Um, nobody has proven that actually empirically. So we are the first ones now to really test to see if that's true. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, you can also say say that we also see the tendency that if you really get absorbed in the music, you may kind of also kind of stiffen and just kind of be so focused that you kind of really yeah. just go inwards. So that would actually mean that you move less. Um, so these are kind of the two different uh, things we're testing at the moment and trying to understand more about what's actually going on here. 
Yes, because uh, there was a concert with uh, Radiohead, and uh, I just heard a story. I have, I have two friends. One of them was dancing like hell, and the other one said, no, I'd rather just stand still and close my eyes because the less that is happening outside me, the more is happening inside me. So he had a bigger experience, more intense experience by just standing still. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to ask um, questions to all of you. Um, to see if you have maybe different opinions about them. Um, so, is there a connection between the type of resonators used in the performance and how much we tend to like the music? And I'm referring to all kinds of resonators, such as your uh, glass bowl there, and your, <laughs> and then the body as a resonator, the room as a resonator. Maybe do you have some things to say about that? Um. <laughs> Um, I like the idea of physical resonance, particularly because it is so accessible to us when we are playing acoustic instruments. And it's always simulated through speakers and software and ways of listening through earphones and plugs and headphones and whatnot. But um, th there's a, there are new commercial devices even for simulating the kind of resonance you might feel on, on kind of speaker systems like this where you feel kind of a really low bass. And there, there are even commercial devices available to haptically simulate that on your body so you get more engaged and so on. But um, I think um, well, the idea of resonance is twofold, right? There's one idea of when I, when I use things like this, there are certain spectra and pitches to which certain objects and their shapes and the placements of the resonators will match with the physical characteristics of the thing that they're placed on, uh, thus kind of creating like a self-looping system that you kind of don't have to touch for a while um, because it amplifies everything that that is being triggered. But also, so yeah, but, but I also like the idea of the room as its body, that is also a certain particular kind of resonance. Um, I, for example, really like to sing in some bathrooms where, <laughs> especially if you hit a D, then it's really sweet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure it's not for no reason that a lot of people sing in the shower. Uh, and all of these are kind of physical bodies. And for, for that reason, I think, what kind of resonance do we like better is best answered by non-musical acoustic experiences as opposed to what music we're listening to and how do we listen to it because the modes of listening to just music are quite limited whereas modes of listening are pretty in much infinite. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so I'm sure that maybe some of the people here are wondering if um, AI music is going to be a threat? Is it going to take over the world in the near or distant future? Should I answer that one? Yeah, we should have a chicharo <laughs> here, I guess, for, <laughs> for that one. Um, no, um, I, don't, I don't think that AI will take over the world, uh, to be honest, uh, although there are uh, people think that the robots will come and eat us alive uh, soon. But um, uh, those of us that have been working a little bit with technology know that the technology is also quite stupid and it will basically do what we also tell, tell it to do. Um, the positive thing, though, about using AI in music is that we can kind of open up an entirely new room of thinking about about these things, and you can expand our possibilities to a large extent. And I think also what what Chichao was showing here, and also uh, Char has been working on, this is, is super interesting in the sense that kind of developing totally new ways of thinking about uh, what an instrument is and how it can kind of keep building music uh, uh, on its own. Uh, and particularly when it connected to a human, that's kind of when I think it becomes interesting that, that the machine is the machine can do something by its own, but it's particularly in kind of the, the meeting point between the human and the machine that, that inter interesting things are happening. So uh, no, I don't see it as a threat, but rather as a, a super interesting possibility. Yeah, so more a collaboration, an interesting human to machine collaboration. Well, that sounds promising. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so sometimes music is described as balm for the soul, and sometimes different moods call for different music. And, but however, there are some kinds of music that are really almost purely intellectual. I mean, you could roll a dice and it would decide what the next uh, tone would be, and etc. 
Um, so I, am, I want to ask you if uh, we need bodies to enjoy music. Do we need this, this very physical aspect of being human beings um, in order to enjoy music? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would be inclined to say yes we do need bodies to enjoy music I mean um, I guess as an intellectual exercise like something like 12 tone music I guess that that's, that would be an example where maybe that the, the link is not so clear but then again the number of people who really enjoy listening to 12 tone music <laughs> is maybe perhaps a bit limited and maybe the also the mechanisms of enjoyment are a bit different but if you think of kind of more broadly our um, kind of everyday enjoyment, engagement with music, I think it has everything to do with having a body. Yeah. Uh, so both in the sense of experiencing the, the displeasurable desire to move to music, um, uh, as well as actually being emotionally moved by music. I mean, that's also something that has a, has a bodily resonance and certain type of physiological reactions that we get goosebumps and things like that, yeah. which are an important part of the uh, enjoyment. Yeah, I mean, I'm, when I, I'm thinking of like, I was going to um, a concert for really, really hard metal music. And it's, yeah, it wasn't something that I had enjoyed earlier, but then, then I f my friend told me, you know, turn off your mind. This is, this is primal music. You have to find the cave of woman in you. So I, I switched off my mind <laughs> and I just I was able to feel just the resonance and I think I was kind of, yeah, I, I started to enjoy it a little bit then. But, um, and then I also noticed that, you know, people are much more comfortable when they're dancing in kind of the dark because they turn off this, uh, the reflexive part of the mind and then allow themselves to be more impulsive. So maybe this is also something that, would you, do you think you would have seen a difference if we had it dark in the room and the audience were not, you know, observed or something? Yeah, possibly. I mean, we're always aware of other people watching or if we're being recorded or monitored, which, I mean, it, it inevitably has an effect on how we are moving or, or behaving. We tend to yeah. think of what other people, how other people are perceiving us or um, how it seems to others. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, possibly, yes. So uh, music is a uh, language we hear, um, and can music possibly help us communicate with other forms of life, even artificial life? Um, and can machines enjoy music? And can cells be possibly uh, positively affected by music? So very open question. Feel free to <laughs> answer. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's, uh, it's funny that you ask. Uh, we ha we have a new project now starting up um, at Ritmo in collaboration with the the, the hospital, um, university hospital, and the idea there is actually to create cell music, music for the cells, with the idea of trying to stimulate the cells to go in a particular way. Um, so we have actually recruited a PhD student that will start in January working on this uh, from our side, and the idea is then to really work with the cells and stimulate them with rhythms and then develop different types of complexity in the rhythms and really see if we can, the, the cells will respond. So this is kind of a part of a larger idea of, of thinking about rhythms in human life, you could say, and really down at a, a very small scale, a much smaller scale than we, than we have worked on before. But uh, kind of the underlying idea here is that we, you look for resonances, as we've been talking about before, and, and also the concept of entrainment, where you have uh, one or more, or two or more um, uh, pulsing pulsing objects, or uh, that you know, that can start actually synchronizing to each other, and then can then entrain to each other. So that's kind of the basic principle we are using there, which is kind of the same thing that you may see, and that we'll see if we can look at some of the data from you as well and see if we actually have entrainment between some of the audience members here that will actually start to see, for example, that you start moving in the same. The same way, this just in the same way that you, if you're walking on the street, that you may sync up with the person that you're walking next to, uh, and all the types of things that you see in kind of in, interpersonal communication. So that's really super exciting to to be able to to look at this. Okay, so I'd like to. I have one last question for all of you, and um, so we are living in quite turbulent times, um, and I'd like to ask you what is the common denominator of the music that has the power to effect change. Um, and how can music help us reach a utopia? And on the other hand, are there also, is there also some kind of music 
that has a negative effect, like it has the power to destruct. So this is my last question, and I'd like to hear answers from all of you. Can I start? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what kind of music can affect change? Um, I think music that somehow uh, really strongly touches us or moves us emotionally. So there's this whole kind of emotional concept called being moved, which has been uh, getting a lot more attention in the, 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 the recent years. Um, and how this emotion of being moved actually has these social consequences of making us more bonded or make us, making us behave more altruistically or more empathically. Um, and we have some preliminary evidence, for example, from, from a study where you, if you listen to a piece of moving music from a different culture, it'll make you feel more positive, more bonded towards that culture, a, you know, a culture that's not your own. Um, but we find that empathic people tend to be more sensitive again to these effects, so it doesn't have the same effect on, it, on everyone. Uh, so music does have this power of bringing people together and make them committed uh, to, a, to a cause that the music is somehow representing. Uh, but, you know, that cause can also be a destructive one. It doesn't need to be, you know, it can be, I don't know, Nazism or whatever. It w you know, if, if that, that music is able to, to move or touch you and bring you, kind of, yeah. make you committed to a cause. I mean, it depends on the cause itself, whether that's yeah. uh, uh, positive or so destructive. Maybe, it's maybe you have to have a common myth or a common fiction about this music. So it's something societal, something that you're thinking together about it. Or could it also be sometimes that it has some parameters like being rhythmic or being uh, interactive or, I mean, are there some, some factors like that as well? Um, yeah, so, so fa one factor indeed would be this, um, so, so to, indu to evoke this feeling of being moved, uh, it, it usually is kind of more um, either you know, kind of melancholic or tender type of music, yeah. sometimes also kind of uh, more uh, kind of heroic type of music can also kind yeah. of move people <laughs> in motion in that sense. Uh, and then the other aspect if, if is that if it really makes people move, want to move their bodies rhythmically and to move together, this type of uh, communal kind of rhythmic mm. uh, movement together, when people are moving in the same rhythm at the same time, uh, it's, it's been shown in also experimental studies that there is something about this kind of synchronous behavior that makes us feel more, more bonded. So it could be one of those two yeah. aspects. Make him either, either moving us emotionally or making us move together. Yeah, yeah. physically together. Mm -hmm. Like the shanties, hey ho and haul away and <laughs> things like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, do you want to say something about this, Tejas Sure. Yeah. Well, I think a little more darkly about this, unfortunately, but maybe realistically, <laughs> because utopia has everything to do with politics and music, like any other thing that humans do, is used to the ends of the things that we otherwise believe and I, like Yomna said, there doesn't have to be, or if effects of synchrony don't always have, or what political direction a utopia should or could take now and 50 years from now and a thousand years from now have representations and echoes in the things that are material to us right now, but those things don't necessarily carry those political meanings within themselves, or um, that's how I think about it anyway, which is that, yeah, what, yeah. So I, I don't know that I really understand what is a musical utopia, but maybe I understand what is a socialist utopia in, in terms of thought, but uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. And Alexander? Yeah, if, if I should, um, there are certainly um, ways that music can be used negatively in, in a political sense as well, and it is uh, around the world these days. But uh, if I should try to end with something on the positive side, I, I also think that music can really help in many ways. And I just thinking back at the opening of Oslo World, uh, which was an amazing experience, I have to say, with the with the kind of the, the healing songs of of uh, kind of the motherly type of. Uh, also uh, songs that were presented there uh, in a very, very strong manner. Shows also the, some of the potential in, in using mu uh, music. I mean, one, one thing that is you're singing to children, but also then 
that you can take this on uh, further and really kind of see how we can can use music positively um, to to make a change. So um, so I, I really think that is possible, and that's also you, you really see music absolutely everywhere, uh, all the time, both in positive and negative connections, and that's also really um, showing the the power of music, I would say, and that's why we are interested in studying it and trying to understand more about what that power of music actually is. So thank you, and um, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, um, Gavin, I think you were first. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned something about uh, bass frequencies helping how, Your question is about how bass frequencies uh, differ from, or, or one more time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. yes, can you speak, Tejasvini, can you tell us a little bit more, more about the commercial product um, that allows us to experience um, bass frequencies in a different way? Yeah. Um, so there have been some products that, uh, it, it's not really about focus, it's just about the haptic experience of low frequencies, which uh, when we're listening to music on headphones or on kind of home speakers and so on, then we don't get the experience of uh, the physical resonance of low bass as we do on a dance floor or in a concert hall. And uh, the idea behind these is to simulate some of those haptic qualities. Um, so there's one that uh, is Backbeat commercial, yeah, uh, called Backbeat and another one called, I forgot the name of it. <laughs> but, but I can tell you later, there's a kind of a watch that, cup, that um, couples with your phone and then it uh, reproduces those kind of low bass frequencies, haptic, that's the idea. It's like your phone vibrating, but much better than that. Yeah, and it really, it really feels different. And also we have, we have been uh, making a, a series of self-playing guitars. These are acoustic guitars. We're playing digital sound into the guitars, but where people can actually touch it and you can feel the sound of, of it as, just, as opposed to just listening to it. It's a very, very different experience to feel the sound with, with your fingers or body. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we have another question here, hello. Hi, uh, this is for Tasha Sweeney as well. I was, uh, I thought the the idea of utopian music or utopian musicians sounded interesting, and you hinted at that it was was it the difficulty in recognizing melody or rhythm that was one of the qualities. Could you elaborate on what are the qualities that make you judge music as utopian or dystopian? Well, here I have to say that it's not me that is doing the judging, but but rather the ways in which, uh, especially some underground scenes have been written about, which care differently about the sonic space itself, but so now I'm thinking about like early metal and distortion and even noise and yeah, the use of noise as music and so on and even kind of making it intellectual in classical uh, composition and so on, which is, which is described as purposely moving away from that which we organically recognize as more musical, but um, the thing is that all of these subcultures and spaces have forced us to rethink what what is what is organic itself and why 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 is it that a noise sitting by a brook or a waterfall, which is really noisy and spectrally horrific, still feels more pleasant than an underground scene belonging to people that are not you, you know? So um, yeah, that's how I think about. Yeah. Yeah. Great. The more questions? Yes. Hi, so I had a question that was slightly relevant to the stuff you were saying about like affinities for rhythm and also what you were saying about you know dark rooms and whether people display more affinity for rhythm in darker settings. And I guess this is two questions. So the first is, uh, has there been any study sort of on the effect of, I don't know, mind-altering substances or psychedelic drugs on people's affinity? I guess it was, this would be really unethical now that I say it <laughs> to actually implement, but do you know of any such study? I know there's a whole book on music and altered states of consciousness, and some of them involve um, also sub substance use, um, but I'm not sure, I don't, I don't think that's experimental work. Uh, I know it's, it's a big trend now, um, um, 
actually in, in psychology and cognition and I thought I think also I think some colleagues from um, Denmark were talking about starting a research project where they uh, use some psychedelics uh, uh, in their experimental settings so I don't think it, it hasn't really been conducted but now there is more and more interest in in that direction uh, but there are some ethical challenges yeah, exactly. yeah for sure is it legal <laughs> yeah okay cool uh, the second thing slightly relevant to that is that do people display sort of more affinity for rhythms that they culturally identify with better so I guess different cultures have really different sort of notions of what is standard rhythm but yeah, did you do you notice that sort of bias, and how do you correct for it, and that sort of thing? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I mean, a lot of uh, most of the research done, like in the field of music psychology and music cognition, is, has a very strong Western bias, which is a, a problem. Also, uh, most of the the researchers come from a Western background, so the questions they tend to address are Western biased, and we know, you know, for example. Um, yeah, th th there there is some there's there's very little cross cultural research done in music perception or music cognition. But there I know of a couple who have that have looked at, for example, rhythm um, rhythm perception or beat perception, and this has shown that if you compare like European and South African participants um, in terms of how they perceive a pulse in in both European and uh, South African folk uh, tunes. Uh, there you get quite a clear cross-cultural difference where actually uh, having this sort of um, speci cultural specific stylistic knowledge of a style of music actually changes where you hear the pulse. So something as simple as where do you perceive the pulse to be can, can shift it quite a bit uh, by just having a specific understanding of that style of music. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Okay, thanks for the questions. Do we still have maybe one more question or are we happy? Yeah. Yeah, it's not really a question. I was just thinking about it when you were talking talking about empathy and movement before that it's a bit maybe simple. Because <laughs> I'm a musician and I play in many different countries and you know, in some countries people are very inclined to move and in other countries they're not. So yeah, I don't think yeah. It, it's more I think it's very much more deeper because in that way I could say that the whole Norwegian People are not an empathetic, <laughs> which I don't think <laughs> is the truth. <laughs> but yeah, it's really interesting. It's a really interesting um, place to dig, you know. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. There are lots of other aspects, like like culture and uh, uh, as well as specific style, like conventions are associated with the style of music or concert behavior that affect our uh, how we move or how we behave to music. But if you have a bunch of people more or less from a similar cultural background, you put them in the same setting, then you start to see these differences, like something like empathy will, will on this kind of group level, will have some sort of ability to predict how, how people are reacting to music. But of course it's not, you can't say, you know, you are, you are empathic or you're not empathic. Uh, of, of individuals, you, you're not able to, of course, make any sort of judgment on that basis. Yeah, I also wanted to say well, really quick, there is also about the products of the base, the, the base frequency products, it's also, there's also a drum chair which uh, resonates with the bass drum. So you sit on it and it, it's for the drummers to feel the, yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, you can hang around and ask uh, questions directly to everybody here as well, uh, but I'd like to hand over now to um, uh, Victor, DJ Victor, who is going to do some data jocking, which is uh, a concept that is uh, particular to Music Lab as well. He's going to look at the data. Uh, the ones of you who have been measured today can come and have a look at um, how you reacted to the music, and he can do some preliminary analysis of it. it. Well, it needs a lot of work, of course, but he can give us a peek into it. So um, first, a quick demonstration for everybody, and then after that, you can all come up and look at your data. And, and thanks for being here. <laughs> we could also say that um, a recording of uh, today's performance is going to be made available online. This is an open science uh, project, uh, Music Lab. So everything that we're doing is uh, is open. And also the data itself uh, will be anonymized, of course. And it will also be made available. So if you want to look at the data and analyze it further, um, then you feel free to do that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much to Jonna Voskaski 
and the teachers Mini Kelker and Alexander Drefsum Jensenius. So. So, hi everyone. So, thank you for staying. Uh, I hope this is not too boring. Um, so I collected data from the accelerometers on your necks uh, just to see if there was something there with the music in, and the performers. So um, this is a very simple uh, script for reading those uh, that data. So I'm. Um, so this is how raw data looks from participant three, if he or she's here. So this is uh, X, Y, and Z, with X being uh, vertical in this case. Um, y being lateral and Z being front and backwards. So this is participant three again. We can see here any other. So we can compare it. We can see Teja Sweeney's uh, movement. Um, and so on. So this is how the raw data looks like. This is a bit useless like this. There's not much to, to extract from this. So we do further analysis on that. One, one f way to do it is just uh, filtering the data. From uh, many studies, we know the frequency of human movement so that we can subtract, let's say, um, frequencies that are not characteristic of humans. It can be just uh, artifacts of the devices that we are using. So in this uh, one, we just filter out anything that's not what we want. and. Uh, so once filtered, the data looks uh, still a bit weird. But you can see how now, so in blue, you have now the, noise, the noisy data before we filtered it. It's offset. You have this drift from the zero, which should be kind of the mean. And then when it's filtered, the data is now around zero. So it's now without the offset, without the drift, which is um, characteristic of this technology that we used. Yeah, yeah. We can make the figure bigger somewhere. Uh, I just want to make it very big, but I don't know if this will help. No. I will have to zoom in, yeah, because otherwise, OK. So again, uh, noisy data offset. This is because of the devices we use. So most of the um, technologies we use to measure movement and other uh, physiological uh, signals they have uh, artifacts uh, due to the, just the, the way they are built. So in this case, for accelerometers, we always have this drift, this offset from the zero, and lots of noise. So many of what we see here, what, a lot of what we see here is not movement itself, especially in this setting where we have people sitting down and just moving very little. So a lot of it is noise. Fortunately, lots of research has been done on what, uh, what are the frequencies char like th that characterize human movement. So by using some filters, we now can um, get rid of that unwanted noise and have a more um, adequate signal to work with. Um, so this is, if we plot all the participants, we can see that there is not, I mean, there is the dominance from participant 10. So I don't know who that was, but uh, um, it seems to be a lot. Um, more than the others, it's covering the others. So then this is still, I mean, it's easier to get some interpretations for this, from, from this, but there is still a lot um, that we cannot see here. So uh, we do something called physical activity counts, which is uh, we basically count how much, we extract the number, how much you move per certain period of time. So this is, again, the filter data from participant. This is in case participant one. We can look at one of the performers today. Let's look at Chare. We cannot look at Chare. <laughs> but we can look at participant 10. That we can, OK. So again, vertical movement, not a lot. Not a lot of head nodding. Some lateral movements and not a lot of frontal. So a lot of perhaps kind of uh, nodding or yeah, maybe disagreeing with something. <laughs> uh, so 
And again, this is easier to get some something out of this. It's already filtered. You can see how it's around the zero. We don't have this drift or offset now. So, um, so this is the physical counts, the physical activity counts. So we establish a threshold, and then we say if so if this person moved. Again, the units here, are just for clarification, this is time in the x-axis, and then or samples per second, and this is the accelerometer uh, acceleration in g's. So one g is 9.8 millimeters per second square. So physical activity counts is we set a threshold for acceleration, and we say if this person moved more than this, then that counts as being active. Uh, so this is, for example, activity counts per samples for participant one. So a lot of movement at the beginning, then it kind of established towards uh, the concert. Uh, we can look at the same participant 10 and have a different pattern, so a lot, a lot of activity in the middle. Uh, as you probably remember at the beginning, we had some vocals at the beginning of the concert. Then the vocals stopped around here, actually. And we have some activity going on when the when Chare was doing more um, uh, muscle activation music. And this is the live coding part. Uh, this is kind of what we do with, with our experiments. We just look at uh, signals from people and compare it with music. So what's happening in this point in time in the music? What's happening in this point in time with the performers? And see if there is some correlation between what what, what we observe in data and what the music is uh, telling us, or what what the music is uh, happening. So this is, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, yeah. So again, this is in X, Y, and Z uh, X axis. So how much that person moved in the three directions. Uh, so now, then we classify the activity by by intensity. So again, there is literature on how much. Uh, in, for example, for adults, how much is uh, light activity, moderate activity, vigorous activity, very vigorous. So this is used also for, for uh, therapy and rehabilitation or for tracking patients at their homes. So we, uh, we can just share these uh, devices with someone and, and ask him to wear it for one day or two days or a week. And then we track physical activity. And then we can see if that person is following certain regime that we, uh, that physicians, for example, uh, ask that person to do. So with this one, we can see how much, oops. Sorry, I have to run this one first. So how much uh, you move per second. In this case, which is expected, you can see that it's not even light. I mean, it's light. It's from zero to 2,000 counts, it's light. So it's light intensity, which is expected you're sitting. Um, so if you were doing some sort of exercise, you can reach levels of uh, vigorous or very vigorous. This is every one of these numbers is a window of of 600 uh, frames. We're tracking at uh, I think 6,000 6, frames. We're tracking at, at 100 um, hertz per second. So 100 samples is one second. In this case, one of these is uh, six seconds. Um, so we can, this one is comparing, for example, a participant one with participant two, although I'm just checking here. Uh, yeah, just uh, checking. Mm, let's look here. Three. So um, yeah, this is a different uh, scale. Mm, I don't know why. Mm, anyway. So physical counts, and then from physical counts we get the physical activity and the, the, in, the intensity of the physical activity. Uh, next thing we can see is, for example, um, how much you move in the. So this is a picture of your movement in from different uh, from the top. So if you see, if you had, we had a camera on the top, this is how kind of how it how you moved in space. So this is again this is participant one, two, and three in this case. So you can see participant two and three had uh, more. Uh, wide range of movement. Participant one was mostly stay, and then something weird happened here. <laughs> like something happened with with uh, again we're tracking neck movement. It's also important the location of the accelerometer. So we're tracking neck, which could tell us a little uh, a bit about head movement. But for example, we wouldn't see if there was some arm movement going on or clapping or not a lot of that. But we can see here any three participants that we want. Uh, mm, 
yeah, for example, we can look at maybe maybe now we can look at the performers, hopefully. No, we cannot. <laughs> so I probably don't can download that data, but we can look at three other participants. Uh, is anyone here that? Seven. So this is you. So you were standing there, I guess, or where were you standing? But it's mostly, you did move. I, I moved a little. Yeah. So you knew about the experiment, so I don't know how that influenced. That's something we also consider when running these things. Uh, we know that the more people know, the more uh, they could be influenced by, by knowing what we try to measure. So we try to, um, that's why we are running this uh, music lab concept where we try to bring the lab to the venues and make it more natural if possible. But there is always some level of, of uh, non-naturalistic behavior. Of course, you're wearing something. So this one is very small thing. We can run experiments with bigger devices that might be more accurate, but then it can be obtrusive. So this is three, uh, again, three participants. We run these type of plots when we try to see, for example, dan people dancing in groups or people dancing in the club. So can we see who moved more? If there was some level of coordination between them, we can plot the, all of them in one space and see how they moved in the space. If there was one person that isolated or if they were dancing in groups, if they didn't dance much, if they were just standing to the music, and then we can compare again that with music or with other conditions in the, in the lab or in the, in the club. Uh, so with this one here, we can compare uh, participants between them. I hope um, takes a little bit. Um, and this is uh, so. This is the smoothest uh, acceleration, but I'm still waiting for these ones to run. So computer is a bit slow now. But um, so. What I would like to do now is to, I mean, if anyone is interested in looking in particular aspects of his or her data, we can approach the, the stage and, and we can have a look at uh, data. We can compare participants that are interested between them. And uh, yeah, just approach the stage if you're interested in your data. Um, but this is more or less what we do here. Yeah, so that would be, thank you. Just uh, one last thing. This is looking at all the participants' um, accumulation of movement, let's say. So how much you move in time, and it just keeps accumulating. So you can see that, for example, participant four had, or no, participant 10, had this sudden extra movement in the second half of the concert. Like it was stable, and then something happened, and then stabilized again. So we can look at this as well in, in time and see how what happened in the music in certain aspects when there was some breakage in the, in the pattern. So something happened for participant 10 here, for example, and participant one was moved considerably more than the rest. I think participant one left the, the room at some point. Did that happen? You see? I was participant four. You were participant four. Okay, so this is probably when you left, and then you came back, and then, yeah. So these kind of things we can see like relatively easy with, with this data, and then we see the music, we see the performers, it's interesting to look at this and then compare this with the movement of the performers and also with the data we have from, from the from the town itself. So, yeah. Is it only repeated rhythmic uh, movement, or is it any like looking around? No, this is anything. Yeah. So okay. this, yeah. I think you have a quite an impact also on the change uh, even the mood and temperature and energy. Mm. You will have lots of traffic. Mm. Mm. Yeah, of course. Uh, Uh, I just want to say that if anybody wants to look at the data, but they don't want everybody to see it, that that's fine. You know, you go to to Victor uh, afterwards, and and he will show you. Okay. So the question was if uh, it also catches head movements to catch things happening on the projector screen, and if you're sitting very close, you will have to move your head more around to see what's happening. So that will probably make a difference in this experiment. Yeah. Yeah. That. Does happen, yeah. That's why, for example, we sometimes use also video to see if there was something going on that's not particularly related to music or to the experiment itself. Um, so also we take notes on what's happening if, if someone, for example, in some experiments that we run, people laugh, 
and we don't I mean that's not something that we are uh, analyzing if they left by accident or because something someone said something funny involuntarily so we don't want that data that's considered like uh, outliers so yes we do look at that for example this person who left the room if we do like academic research on this we wouldn't probably consider that part when, when this person left the room so uh, and, and so on so yeah also head movement that's also when you choose what to track if we were tracking our movement then we would have if you were drinking something we would have like your movement when you were drinking or if you were clapping so we wa we didn't want that this time so we were focusing on head movement a little bit so everything was happening on the stage but we know that for example it could be interesting to see if when someone on the stage was doing something particularly relevant then the attention of the people turned if we see heads turning towards that direction for example There seem to be three pairs of participants there. If we just look at the cumulative d mm -hmm. data, yeah. Um, any any ideas what you might do about that or with that? Well, in in see previous where they stood or yeah, in previous studies we've seen if they sit together, if they know each other. Uh, maybe they didn't, and there's they were just all of them very uh, still. But it can happen that they were sitting together. Also happens that the three that are very active sit, were sitting together, for example, or we have patterns, for example, yeah, as, as you mentioned, maybe these three were together and these two were together and these four were together. So it's interesting to look at that as well. Uh, we also take uh, in questionnaires uh, that you were instructed to ask to fill afterwards, if you play an instrument, if you're a musician yourself, if that, how that influences uh, how you move to music or how you, uh, um, experience music in general and uh, we are also interested in other uh, personality traits empathy and, and so on so looking at movement but also other in this case it's movement but we also look at breathing patterns or muscular activity how that relates to our personalities and how we react to music and also all the aspects involved in social behavior and uh, yeah entrainment Uh, stupid question, but yeah. was the, the music intended to elicit a sort of specific response? Because I see, for instance, that a participant one has these sort of couple of distinct sort of distinctive humps in the mm. data, like around 6,000 and around uh, 11,000 maybe. Yeah. Uh, was the music intended to get that sort of response or not? I wasn't involved in the, in the okay. creative well, process, so I don't think so, the but maybe they were. I don't know. You okay. We can ask the performers if, if they thought of that, yeah. if there's someone here. They are gone. Oh, yeah, okay, cool, but thanks. Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes we do do that. We play, in our experiments, we play music that we feel that might create something in, like in, the, in our data, and then we see if it happens. In this case, I don't think so, because we weren't involved. Uh, the data analysis and the creative process weren't hand in hand this time, but uh, we can do that, yeah. There was a part that was more uh, rhythmical, so yeah. maybe that was intended to yeah, it could be, it, it, which is actually like the second half. Uh, so it would be interesting to see if there were some more intensive activity in the second half when the rhythmic uh, part started. Yeah. Okay. So I think um, this this was enough uh, for now, right, Victor? Yeah. For yeah, the yeah. presentation, or did you have something more to show us? Uh, no. If people approach, we can like, have some more yeah. individual kind of things that we can discuss if, if they're interested in their data. Okay, so so thank you, and um, if you want to look at your data, go up and and uh, and talk to Victor, mm -hmm. and he doesn't show it on the screen unless you want to. I mean, you can see it just on his small screen as well. So thank you all for uh, being here. It's been wonderful. Um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.